If you could describe yourself in one word, what would that word be? I mention it all the time that I grew up in a very religious environment full of legalism and subjugation and suppression and false doctrine. And out of that environment came certain labels that were placed on me. Because I'm a female, I was labeled as second class, tolerated for the purpose of bearing children. And because I was taught this from a young age, I believed it and this molded my self-image. And that programming opened me up to religiously justified abuse within my marriage. He took full advantage of these false teachings and used them as permission and fuel to subjugate and abuse me to the point that I was slowly brainwashed and reprogrammed into a completely different person. He successfully erased any understanding I had of my own personal worth, and out of that came even more labels that he had placed on me. Embarrassing, outsider, other, boring, uninspiring, stupid, silly, childish, useless, selfish, lazy, unwanted. And because religion said that as a female, my purpose was to become a godly wife and a mother. When I finally escaped that abusive relationship, even more labels were placed on me. Broken, divorced, childless, failure. And for 15 years after my divorce, I allowed these labels to define me. It drove my existence and they kept me from seeing my value. And they kept me from interacting with others. They kept me silent and they kept me from sharing my story, and they kept me from stepping into my future and my calling. Words spoken over us mold our identity for better or worse. Other people use words to define us based on our appearance, our personality, our character, our skills, our actions, their own opinions, their own assumptions. And we place labels on ourselves based on our perceptions of other people's appearance personality, character, skills, and actions. Comparison. Words are powerful, and they shape us, and they identify us, and they can either build us up or tear us down. They define who we think we are and who we think we should be. And Arden Bevere, the creator of this study plan and the full course on Messenger X, did a survey with millennials and asked the question that I posed at the beginning. If you could describe yourself in one word, what would it be? And the responses surprised him and saddened him. Lost, unhappy, searching, hungry, distracted, lazy, broken, lacking, entitled, disillusioned. We believe these things to be true about ourselves, but this is so much less than what we're called to be. Scripture says the exact opposite. In 1 Peter 2, 9, it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Pay attention to these labels. Called, chosen, which implies wanted. Royal, Holy, special, priesthood. The world sees us as who we once were, or who we are now. At least in their eyes, which often isn't even true. God has a completely different view of us than the world. He sees us as we truly are and speaks into our future. God is calling us to step into the words that he's spoken over us. Our calling and who God calls us to be far outweighs any labels that are put on us by humans. Our calling goes beyond our past trauma, it goes beyond our past mistakes, and it goes beyond our current circumstances. Labels shrink our world, and callings enlarge it. Labels disqualify and limit us, and callings qualify and release us. Labels are temporary, callings are eternal. The Arden's mom, Lisa Bevere, often teaches that the spiritual attacks that we go through in life are based on who we're going to become, not on who we are or who we used to be. The enemy doesn't attack someone he doesn't see as a threat, and he'll try to get us to question our true identities 
as sons and daughters of the Most High, to stop us from stepping into our callings. The enemy did this with Jesus in the wilderness. He questioned his identity as God's son and tried to provoke him into doing something he shouldn't. But Jesus didn't fall for it because he didn't have any doubts about his identity. If he had fallen for it, it would have caused him to fail in his mission here on earth. And this is the strategy that the enemy uses on all of us. The enemy knows your true identity and is threatened by it and does everything he can to keep you from stepping into your true identity and calling. He almost succeeded and did succeed for a long time with me. But starting in around 2018, after years of praying and fighting distractions and lies, God helped me to realize that all of those lies or those labels were based on how others saw me, not on how he sees me. And then I prayed for him to help me see myself the way he sees me. And he answered immediately as well as slowly over time. And that opened up the floodgates of healing and it helped me to find a new voice to replace the one that I'd lost. And it helped me to begin the journey of stepping into my own calling as a child of the Most High God. You need a strong and firm understanding of who you are in Him so you can stay focused and not be deceived or distracted by the lies or the attacks that, when they come, and they will come. Doubts will continue to rise up even when we run to God for help. Running towards God doesn't mean that we won't have doubts or questions. But when we have doubts or questions, that means that God is setting us up for growth. And how we respond is up to us. That will determine whether we grow or regress or continue on in stagnation. For example, with my situation, here I am back in my hometown where all these labels started. But I feel like God has me here for a reason. I think he's wanting me to deal with some of this stuff that I haven't dealt with yet. So my response to the situation really matters. Do I keep trying fighting and to get out of dodge again? Or do I start seeking out what it is he's trying to show me? My instinct is to run. Knowing that he's trying to show me something through all of this gives me hope and gives me the strength to stay instead of running away. And that's what we all have to do. Dig in and start seeking answers. Don't fear the process. Don't run away. Embrace the journey. Don't let others dictate your journey. Go find the answers for yourself. And it's very important to know that our worth is not in what others think of us. It's not in these labels that others place on us. It's not in our own achievements. It's not in how well we do something. Our worth is rooted in our relationship with God. After my divorce, I spent many years trying to prove myself, achieving things to prove myself to others and to prove that those labels that were put on me were lies. And even when I did get praise from others, it felt empty. It didn't make a difference in my feelings of my own self-worth because I still saw myself based on those old labels. I still hadn't reconciled this loving God, and I still didn't trust him at that point. I still saw him as hateful and vengeful. So I still had to reconcile his true character and his love for me before I could start breaking down all of those old labels and all of those old lies. I did stupid things, trying to prove myself I was wanted, trying to prove myself that I was interesting. And as a result, I have regret. We all have regrets. The question is what we do with that. We can either beat ourselves up and add more labels to the pile, putting us in even worse mental state. Or we can finally realize that our worth isn't determined by our behaviors. It's determined by our relationship with God. We are made in his image, and if we accept and follow Jesus, we can receive new life in him. Imagine a blank slate where all of those past regrets are wiped clean. It doesn't mean that we take his grace for granted and just live life the way we want. It does mean that we can get back up when we inevitably fall again. So when we have regrets, if you, if you don't have any, give it time, you will. Instead of adding on to the negative labels, think of how Jesus loves you and values you. He loves you beyond anything you could hope or imagine. He values you immensely, greatly. And when we can finally wrap our heads around that, we can start finding our value in him instead of in ourselves or our own behaviors or accomplishments or in other, how other people see us. And this redefines how we see ourselves. How we see ourselves starts in our minds with our thoughts. Our thoughts shape everything around us. 
We have to be intentional about what we feed our minds. Are we going to fill them with negative thoughts and influences? Or are we going to focus on what God says about us? It's either the enemy's lies or God's truths. You have to choose with intention what you're going to spend time consuming and thinking about. In the study plan, Arden Bevere mentions that studies show that we only make 4 to 6% of our decisions consciously. The rest are instantly made subconsciously. And that means that 95% of our decisions are made with intentional, without intentional thought. And that means that we're only exercising free will 4 to 6% of the time. What we choose to feed our minds drives the other 95% of our decisions. The words we speak on ourselves, the words we speak on others, the movies we watch, the music we listen to, the images we look at, the video games we play, these things are what drive our decisions whether we realize it or not. Our subconscious is driven by repetition, not rationality. The thoughts that we repeat over and over in our minds become normalized, and we start to believe those negative thoughts and influences. And that's why we believe those labels that have been placed on us. And that's also the key to how we tear them down. Paul says that the battle that we fight is not a physical battle with human enemies. It's a battle in our minds and in our spirits. But the good news is that God has equipped us with the weapons that we need to win the battle. In 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not human weapons but are made powerful by God for tearing down strongholds. We tear down arguments and every arrogant obstacle that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to make it obey Christ. And this isn't easy, and it will be a struggle, and that's why it's called a battle, but it's one worth winning. Those that have been coming here for any amount of time know my past, but what you may not know is that with that past, I have P PTSD. Certain things trigger me into flashbacks. And for those that don't know, flashbacks are where you relive past traumatic experiences. And when you're in one, you have no control over it. You lose track of reality while you're stuck mentally in a past experience. And you're powerless to it. And I don't even remember how I figured this out. I think it was a book by Tony Evans, and I've included that link in the resources, if you scroll down to that. Um, it's called 30 Days to Overcoming Emotional Strongholds. And that book says that the way to fight off those flashbacks or any emotional stronghold was to repeat God's truth in, that's from his word over and over in my head. So I would start repeating 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5 over and over in my head. And I would just keep repeating it while I was in my flashback until the flashback went away. And it worked every single time. And that's exactly what we have to do to rewire our brains. We have to start repeating God's truths over and over in our minds instead of constantly replaying the negative thoughts and constantly consuming negative content. In Philippians 4 and 8, it says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is worthy of respect, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if something is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. The more we think on God's good things, the more we'll begin to look, think, and act like Christ. And the more and more our minds will be renewed and we'll start experiencing joy instead of worry, anxiety, and depression. And I mentioned it at the beginning that there, there's the Bible app link that's shared in the Discord and in the Twitch. And it will be shared later for those watching this on demand. It'll be in the show notes on YouTube. But if you scroll down to the Keep Studying section, I've included a link to the full course on Redefined in the Messenger X app. And I've also included the link to that book by Tony Evans and some additional resources by Bible Project. And if you scroll down to the self-reflection section, I've posed some questions for you. So check those out and really take the time to think through them. 
and spend some time fighting those negative labels that have been placed on your own life. And then next time we meet, we're going to take a closer lab look at the labels that God has placed on us. So I'm going to pray us out and then we'll continue. We'll switch over after I pray us out to um, talk about this offline. And then those of you that are going to be watching this later on demand, uh, again, check the show notes for those uh, links to those resources. So I'm going to go ahead and pray us out. Thank you, Father, for everyone who was able to join us today. Thank you for everyone in our community, whether they can make it here or not. Please touch each and every one of their lives. Please let them know that these labels that have been, they have been fighting and believing their whole lives, these negative labels, maybe they've put them on themselves. Maybe others have put them on them. Help them to fight these labels. Help them to know that that is not the truth. Help them to fight each and every one of those labels with your truth. And start ingraining your truth into their minds instead of the lies that we've been believing our whole lives. Please let them see a bit of the real you each and every day as we go through our day. Touch them, bless their lives, remind them of the truth of who they are in you. Don't let us forget, Father. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.